Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Paul Atherton is an ex-Wall Street advisor on a mission to help young people win back their financial power, wealth and security. He does this by helping them understand the hidden world of finance, risk and investments, helps them figure out how it impacts them and to seize the opportunities to make it work to their advantage. This is Paul Street Journal. I'm here with Paul Afton. How are you this morning? Hi, Tim. Yeah, I'm doing really well. Oh, that's good to hear. I'm in a, what I can say is a long-term relationship now. We're thinking about moving out. I'm just wondering if there's something I can think about before buying a house. Oh, that's, yeah, good good question, Tim. And I think um, well, there are a number of aspects that uh, one should go through before buying a house or even going and contemplating buying a house. And so I think about this in terms of six major points. So let's cover those real quick. So the first is your credit score or strengthening your credit score. Now, whether you know it or not, everybody that sort of lives and breathes has a credit score. And it ranges from zero to 1,200. That's in Australia. I think in the States, it's about zero to 800. So it's a different scoring system, but the basics are essentially the same. So zero to 1,200, it's done by a group, I think it's called Equifax or VEDA. used to be VEDA, but it's bought by Equifax. Anyway, so that's 1,200. Out of 1,200, you want to be in the top half, so 600 and above. If you're in the bottom half, you're considered to be a bit risky. That means that essentially that you're uh, more likely than not to have an adverse, what they call an adverse event. An adverse event may be a default, you can't make a payment, or it could just be something make, like a late payment. And of course, the lower the, on the spectrum you go, the more likely you're going to make a, the credit score predicts that you're gonna make a, have an adverse event and the severity as well. And the higher it is, the closer you get to 1200, the less likelihood, the less likely the, uh, you are to, to have a credit uh, event, like a default, a late payment or a missing payment. So you want a higher credit score. Um, and there are many aspects on what constitutes a good score, and perhaps we can go over that at a separate time. Number two would be figure out what you can afford. That seems a little bit obvious, but I think with the enthusiasm, a lot of young buyers go in and they walk straight into a, a state agent with those bright eyes and go, we can just go straight on. I want the nicest house possible. But I think it's best to go and sit back, go over your budget, see what you can afford from a mortgage perspective and that will then determine what kind of uh, house you can afford. So don't walk into an estate agent without knowing that number. Why? Because an estate agent's gonna know what your budget is. And genuinely, from my experience, a real estate agent will try and push that budget a little bit higher. And often you can try and manage that expectation by lowering what your threshold would be when you talk to them. So your threshold may be, let's say I can afford Half a million dollars. Well, the first thing you might want to talk to your estate agent and tell them. So it's 400, 450. They'll push it. Trust me. That's what they do. Um, and then, you, you know, work within that budget. Third is save down for that payment. So save down for your first deposit. Now, I'm very insistent on this. Quite insistent for, for people is to really search for that 20% of your mortgage. 20% is sort of a magic number. It's a magic number for a couple of reasons. So the first is you walk in to a bank and you say, I want to have a mortgage. We're looking at a house around $500,000. We go, okay, that sounds lovely. You really need to walk in with $100,000 in cash. Or a little bit more, depending because there's a lot of um, transactional costs that are not often thought about. But 20% is what you need. I'm very insistent on this. Because why? Two reasons. It proves to yourself and to the bank that you have the ability to save, and this is very important. And even if you have to borrow from family and friends, it's still important that you're able to do this. And secondly, for your own financial stability is that you avoid LMI, lender's mortgage insurance. This is dead money. This money that doesn't protect you. It's money that you pay to protect the lender. So. Try and avoid that. Put more than 20% down, you won't have to pay 
those that extra money for insurance for somebody else. I mean, people don't like paying insurance for themselves, but paying it for a bank is uh, is something we should try and avoid. Fourth is build a healthy savings account. Now, this may sound obvious, but banks and lenders really look at how you've done at saving your your savings capacity. And I think it, that also does two things. It, it gives you confidence that you're able to do it. It gives the banks and the lenders confidence that you can do it. And of course, that healthy savings account can go towards that 20% and it can also go to those extra payments that might be required when you buy a house. Maybe you want to you know, put in the kitchen or do up the backyard and so on. So build a healthy savings account. So number five is get pre-approved for a mortgage. Now this is not often done. We do this usually backwards. We find a house that we really want. We then scrounge to find the mortgage and beg, borrow and steal and we end up in potentially not the best position. But if you already come in with a pre-approved mortgage, let's say you have that 20% down, you can now afford half a million dollar house, so that's great. Um, You're in a very powerful position. Why? Because you have no what's called a chain. Real estate agents have chains. And what chain is, is simply this. When you purchase a place, when somebody purchases a house, it's usually dependent on the sale of their house. So they can't afford the house until the sale of their house. Well, guess what? The same goes for their very house. And this chain can go on and on. I heard a case once when I bought my apartment many years ago in London that a sale went through, but sorry, a sale failed because of a chain that was 20 houses long and number 19 went down and that was it. There you go, there, you go, there went the chain. But if you walk in, you, you, you break the chain, you walk in with a pre-approved mortgage, there is no chain, you're it. And what I want your listeners to do, if you have this, this is bargaining power. You should get reward for this extra due diligence, this extra time that you've taken. The fact that you're coming in with effectively cash to buy a house, you have no chain, you should get a discount on the house. You should be able to have some excellent bargaining power. And if you're not, if you're not getting that, then you should probably look at another place. So get pre-approved for mortgage. And the final point I tell people is buy a house you like. Now, this sounds a bit silly but you're spending an awful lot of your money I, I think you should damn well like it and actually you should love it so this is an investment yes but I like to think of how houses as something slightly different and Tim you know I'm a big believer in investments and you know playing a long game in terms of building your wealth but for a house it's not just building wealth it's stability it's a sense of community it's a st- sense of security and stability in your whole life um you should love this place. This is something where you should be in a, a neighborhood, an area that you're going to grow to love. And I'll, I think often people weigh too heavily into the investment and forget, actually, this is more than that. This is also a place that you're going to live. So that are the six points, Tim. That's what I really would suggest people think about. So I, I guess buying. the only question I've got in all of that would be with the pre-approved mortgages, if I'm a first home buyer, it makes a lot of sense. If I already own a house, what's the complication in getting a pre-approved mortgage if I'm still waiting on my old house to yeah, sell? So is there a way to work there, around that? There is a sort of way of doing it. Okay, so you'll go to a lender, you'll walk in, you say, I want to buy a house. Now, you could do it under two ways. You could have enough cash flow, you could have enough savings that you could do it irrespective of the sale of your house. So you're essentially the same. Yes, you have a house but you also have a enough money down that you can buy your new house. And so that the sale of your house is nothing more but, I don't know, gravy or um, extra down payment once you've got over the line. Genuinely, that doesn't happen. Generally, you're in a position where you're like, uh, I really have to s- sell the house. My, my purchase of the new house is dependent on my house. But get all your bells and whistles. Get everything in order. Get the lender. Get the loan. Get everything approved. You can get everything in alignment so you're really good to go just for the sale of your house. There are a lot of groundwork that you can do prior to, prior to purchasing any property, whether it's your second or your first. Perfect. Well, that's very informative. Thank you for coming in today, Paul. Great, Tim. Thank you. Paul Street Journal. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. 
I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.